Allah, you might take my life anytime. So let me work my hardest now. Now that you've given me the health, the strength, the finances, let me work and serve you in your direction starting now. Let me not wait. Can you believe that? Someone's grave is predestined for them. A hole is being dug for you and you don't even know it yet. There's a hole waiting for you with your name on it, but you just don't know it. Some of us are gassed up and think that we're going to have a great death. We're going to die with the shahada on our tongue. But how can you die with the shahada on your tongue when you're just singing all the latest songs and the raps all the time? How can the shahada be on that list, on that tongue playlist of yours, when all you do is rap all day long, sing songs all day long? How is the shahada going to be the last words on your tongue when you know, you're reciting some lyrics from Juice World or Drake or someone like that? How is the shahada going to be on your tongue? In Alhamdulillah, Nahmadu wa nasta'inahu wa nasta'afiru wa na'udhu billahi min shuri anfusina wa min sayyati a'imadina Man yahdillah wa falamudillah wa man yudlil falahadillah wa ashadu wa la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la sharika la wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in the whole Qur'an Ya ayyuhal ladhina amunat qullaha haqqa tuqati Oh, you who have believed, inshallah, Allah is talking about us. Oh, you who have believed, have consciousness of Allah. Be mindful of Allah. Be knowing that Allah is watching you in every condition that you're in. And do not die in any other condition except in the full submission and surrender to Allah. Before I do continue with this and topic as well, uh, I would advise you, if you're here for the Jumma Khutbah, to come up. To come up, move up against, so the closer you are, over here, the better. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explained to us that if you understood the benefits of being in the first stuff, you would fight each other for it. So please, don't leave it empty, come to the front of the Jumma Khutbah. Today's topic is supposed to be called, or allowed around the lines of remembering death. But my brothers and sisters, the reality is whether you remember death or not, death is always remembering you. It's as simple as that. True story, recently I had to bury a loved one. And if you don't believe me about this, and if you think that there's some misconceptions about death, which there are, a lot of us think that the misconception about death is, you know, you're, you know it's only for older people. Please don't believe me. Go visit a graveyard. Take your family over there. It would be a great field trip. Take your family, go visit a graveyard so that you could be proven wrong. Whenever someone passes away, they're like, oh, they died young. There's these false misconceptions in our head that death is exclusively for the elderly or for those who've accomplished their dreams and they've done what they wanted to do. Somehow making us deluded to think that death is somehow gonna knock on your door, ask your permission, and then take your life. That's not how it works. If you don't believe me, visit a graveyard and look at the tombstones. Look at the ages of those who died. Sure, you'll find some who are elderly, mashallah. But a lot, you're also going to find those who are regular age, that you would think that they should be alive, but they went too young. Still don't believe me? About two weeks ago, some of our own youth passed away. Well, like, what their family must have been, I don't even know. How do you even recover from something like that? Two youth passed away, about the 17 years old. Some kids over here are 17. It could have been any one of us. But death does not discriminate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Kullu nafsin maut. Every soul shall taste death. Every soul shall physically, they will know what an experience is like. They will understand the pains of death. The same way if you get a splinter that tastes or feels different. The same way that if you were to get a paper cut that feels different. The same way that if you were to twist your ankle, the pains of the ankle pain are different than any of the splinter or the paper cuts. Similarly, the taste of death is so unique that you get to taste it once and it's the most severe taste that you'll ever have. Allah SWT is saying, every soul shall taste it. You'll know what it is. There's people who don't believe in this idea. They think of some fantasy living in science fiction that somehow they're going to escape death or they could build some time machine. It doesn't work that way. We are given one opportunity and we have to do the best we can in this world. This should motivate us to accomplish more.
It shouldn't cause us to surrender. No, it should be like, Allah, you might take my life anytime. So let me work my hardest now. Now that you've given me the health, the strength, the finances, let me work and serve you in your direction starting now. Let me not wait. The reason I'm telling you about a family member who has passed away is because when you go to the graveyard, it's a different type of vibe. The same way that there's an Eid festival, you go there, you feel good. When you go to a graveyard, it's the exact opposite. You feel, whoa, a little bit more humbled, a little bit more of a reminder that, whoa, we all are going to enter over here. And it doesn't matter how much you love that person. We love the person that we were burying. We love them. We hate to see them go. But wallahi, none of us would jump in the grave with them at all. We love them to death, but it stops at death. It won't go to the grave. That's what the saying is. We love you to death, but we will never jump in the grave with you. My brothers and sisters, when you enter your grave, you're going to be all alone. And the Messenger وسلم, explained to us about two angels who will come to you, visit you in the grave, and they will ask you three specific questions. Questions that seem remedial, like basic, like, I know those. Those are easy answers. But when you see their face, you see the cadence, the gait of these angels, you'll forget everything, unless Allah makes it easy for you on that day. Still don't believe me? Go to a graveyard, I recommend it. We went there for a janazah, but then we saw people digging another grave. We said, we asked them, I stopped to ask them, I said, hey, who are you taking this for? They said, no, they haven't died yet, but we're just preparing for whoever comes next. Can you believe that? Someone's grave is predestined for them. A hole is being dug for you, and you don't even know it yet. There's a hole waiting for you with your name on it, but you just don't know it. You're too caught up thinking that this life is it. Now, it's not just you, it's me too. We hope for the best, we pray for the best, but the reality is, my brothers and sisters, we sometimes forget about the reality of this dunya. That this dunya is just glamour, it's zina. It's just something that's decoration. It's the sprinkles on the ice cream, that's all it is. The real home is in paradise. The real home that we have to go to is somewhere else. But before we make a stop at that home, before we get to our final, final place, there's another home that we have to go to, and that's the grave. That's a night that only is so unique to all of you that none of you could ever come back and describe to the living how that experience was. By the age of 12, I had moved like six or seven places in my life. I was very home insecure when I was growing up. And I remember something, that every single night I slept in a new place, there were always these sounds, these, these twitches, these little flickers, these these, this uncomfortable uh, feeling, being in a new bed, being in a new home, being under a new roof. Imagine what that would feel like inside the grave. Imagine what would that be like when you're in the grave all by yourself. And the footsteps walk away and the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explains that once the final footsteps have walked away, they've left, that's when it all begins. And the second part of this, we're going to talk about what actually happens in the grave to help us strengthen our iman and to prepare a little better as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Before I tell you how to prepare for death, I want to leave you with a little bit of story before jumping into that. The story is of a somewhat youth, and it gets told in multiple ways, but the moral of the story is more important. That there's a youth with Suleiman alayhi salam. And Suleiman alayhi salam is doing his thing. You know, we have controls over so many things. The winds by Allah's permission, the jinn, it's just a crazy situation. So this youth is with Sulaiman as he's constructing stuff and just putting these, these gifts that Allah has given him to work. He's not sitting on them, he's not being lazy with them, he's working. Whatever Allah has given him as a resource, he's putting it to work. So this youth is with him and this man comes and is staring at this youth very, very precisely in a keen way that's making him feel kind of uncomfortable. You ever felt that you're somewhere and someone's looking at you, they're staring at you, you look from the side of your eyes, they're still looking, you move away, they're still looking at you, that's kind of scary. 
He's looking at him and he felt very uncomfortable. Some stories go as the following. That this youth, after he stood there for some of the time, very long time enough to make him feel uncomfortable, he asked him, Imam Islam, who is that? It's, you know, making me feel uncomfortable. So Imam Islam explains that that's the angel of death. The youth got so afraid, this young man got so afraid, he told Sulaiman Islam, using the winds, using his power, send me somewhere else, I don't want to be near. If he's in the room, I don't want to be here. So he leaves and he goes to another place. Some people say he sent him all the way to India, Allahu Alam. This young man gets over there and waiting for him over there is the angel of death and the angel of death swiftly just takes his life away. Simple as that. What's so special about that story? It's about what happens after he takes away his life. You see, the angel of death comes back to Suleiman Islam and explains to Suleiman Islam how he was sort of stuck, wondering in amazement that how is it that I'm supposed to take this man's ruh, his soul, all the way in this other area, but he's still hanging out with you over here? I didn't understand it. And we know from this story, and we learn the lesson that none of us will ever be able to escape death. Death will find you. It has no age, it doesn't care about if you're healthy or if you're sick, it will come for you when the time is right for you. And my brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, the time is appointed for you already, you just don't know when it is. The three things that I want you to take away from this right now, besides wherever you are, death will find you is that you have to be in constant preparation for death. The Messenger وسلم, would make this beautiful dua. And in this dua, he would ask Allah Azawajal to purify him and grant him a good death. This is the Messenger of Allah There's nothing that could happen to this man. This man is the best of people to ever walk this earth. Yet he is teaching us to ask for a good death. Some of us have this idea that somehow death is going to come to us, knock on our door, announce itself. But that's not really what happens. I was witnessing during the COVID time, I love a family member of ours, they were passing away, and the doctor said that there's nothing else you could do for this person besides just be there for them remotely. We couldn't go because of COVID. So they have this love family member of mine on the TV is played, and they're literally taking their last breath. Imagine their children watching. Imagine what the environment must feel like. Eventually, with some time, this person, this loved one, stopped breathing. And it, we didn't even know when it happened, but the root of this individual was taken away. We asked Allah SWT to bless them and guide them and protect them and grant them an easiness and comfort in their grave in the highest levels of paradise. I mean. Their life and soul was taken from them so swiftly that none of us could even blink or bat an eyelid. It just happened so smoothly. Because death does not announce itself. Death comes to you and it will be there for you whether you're ready for it or not. The messenger asks us to ask and invoke for a good death. Some of us are gassed up and think that we're going to have a great death. We're going to die with the shahada on our tongue. But how can you die with the shahada on your tongue when you're just singing all the latest songs and the raps all the time? How can the shahada be on that list, on that tongue playlist of yours when all you do is rap all day long? Sing songs all day long. How is the shahada going to be the last words on your tongue when you know you're reciting some lyrics from Juice World or Drake or someone like that? How is the shahada going to be on your tongue? Explain this to me. Explain to me how your last act is going to be a sajda when you don't even pray. What's up with that? When is that going to change? Are you waiting for some invitation? Do you think it's going to be when you go to Umrah or when you go to Hajj? I don't even know when they're going to open up again for us. Or if you're going to be even blessed and lucky to see that, stop wasting your time. Going straight to the three questions that the angels will ask all of us. A lot of us know them. They're simple questions. The first question is, who is your Lord? Simple. We're sitting here, Allah, duh. But in that panic of a moment, you won't know unless Allah has given you strength. He's firmed your feet. He's firmed you. And you're able to say it's Allah. But how can that be your answer if you have not prepared for those questions? If in this dunya you're not preparing for these three questions, my question to you now is how do you plan on answering them? 
You won't be able to if you're not preparing for those answers in this dunya. If your Lord is your nafs, what to say then? If your Lord is your desires, I don't know what to tell you. The second question is what's your deen? What path did you follow? What's your religion? We know the answer, it's simple, straightforward. But in the panic, you won't know. But you know what the Messenger وسلم, explained to us? That you're on the deen of your best friends. You're on their path. You're on their deen. You're on their way of, way of life. Because you're following a specific circuit or path. Hopefully it's Islam. But for a lot of us, we are on the deen of our friends and our company and our surroundings and our environment. Sometimes society. We really have to ask ourselves, are we on the deen of Allah? Because if you get in the grave and they ask you, it's too late. You got to start preparing for these answers starting now. You make the intention starting today, not tomorrow because tomorrow is not promised. Your hold is already written. It might happen today. Don't wait for it. Change up right now. The final question is, who is your messenger? Who is your messenger? Straightforward question. In the moment, you won't get it unless Allah has made that easy for you. Unless you lived your life in accordance with the teachings of this messenger. But how can you answer this question? When the only time you pick a sunnah is when it suits you. Every other sunnah, you won't do it. You might not even pray, but when it comes to the fourth life, you are down for that sunnah. Doesn't make sense. If you want to be able to answer all of these questions concisely, promptly, excitedly, if you want to do that with no fear, it starts by preparing for the answers, not just in this dunya with your words and speech, but with your actions as well. Start preparing for the day that you will meet Allah before death comes and swiftly catches you and leaves us all in a disarray, so to speak. We ask Allah SWT to forgive us. We ask Allah SWT to bless us. We ask Allah SWT to guide us. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to bless our graves and all the Muslims who have deceased and left this dunya, make it easy for them and make their graves a garden of paradise. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to bless the Ummah, bless all of those who are struggling in the Ummah, and we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala for whoever is listening to this, watching this in our presence, that Allah that you have sent these angels allows to be recorded amongst those who are of true believers and who will enter paradise and to take from this actionable items for us to become better people once we leave this uh, khutbah as well.